From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. In this episode of Fragmented, I've started a mini fragment series called Learning Kotlin. As you would have figured out if you've listened to previous shows, I'm relatively new to Kotlin and I've started on this exciting journey to get better at the language. I usually like taking notes when I begin to learn something, so this time around I thought I'd share those notes with you folks uh, in audio form. So in this first episode, I look at what Kotlin means by properties as first-class language features. There are some interesting nuances. I try to take a deep dive into the hood to see what they really mean by this. Are there some interesting nuances in the differences of the implementation? Uh, I go into a lot of the details. So listen on and on to the show. Hey folks, Kotlin now has first party support. Everyone is thrilled. I'm relatively new to Kotlin, but given that this is going to now be my language of choice, I have to learn it well, like really well, like as well as I currently know Java. And I've been doing Java for some time now. So I've been trying to spend a little more time with the language and really trying to understand the different parts, you know, like the philosophy behind the language, uh, the nuances that differentiate it from Java, etc. And so Anytime I run across a concept that I think is a little different from the norm, uh, you know, the if I stop to pause or it makes me think like, oh, that's interesting, I should read or learn more about that, then I want to call it out. So I'm jotting these notes down and I'm doing these mini fragments so I can share it with you as uh, I learn them and, you know, we can learn together. Now, again, the objective with these fragments is not to necessarily teach you the syntax or even like the language per se, because there's no better way to do this than actually just coding or looking at the docs, right? So instead, what I want to do is add more color to some of these concepts and maybe help us jointly get a better understanding of the language uh, in a way that some may not have had the time to do necessarily with Java. So let's get started. This week, I want to talk about a fundamental basic concept that Kotlin calls properties. Now, I was reading this book on Kotlin called Kotlin in Action, which, by the way, is a great book. Uh, If you're looking for a recommendation, definitely my first uh, book recommendation. So in this book, they say properties are a first-class language feature in Kotlin. This is sort of the thing that you would usually glance over and say, yeah, yeah, cool, and, you know, move on to the next thing. But I wanted to really understand what they meant by that. You might think this is super basic and there's nothing necessarily interesting. But if you listen on, you'll understand the ethos behind that statement. And you'll also find out uh, some interesting gotchas. So let me ask you first, do you actually know the difference between a field and a property? Well, in Java land, at least, a field is basically, you know, like an internal variable that the class uses. But when that field has accessors, uh, or in other words, getters and setters, then these fields take a new form. They're given a special name called property because suddenly now this field has more weight, right? It describes the class in a very important way. And the way you interact with uh this class or sort of make changes to this class is via the getters and setters of this uh, field or property. Now, if you want to create a property in Java, there's really nothing special because there's no such thing as a property. All you do is you create a field or a variable in your class object and you add a manual getter and a manual setter and this becomes a property. So it's like a very manual process that you have to create. But in Kotlin, they did something cool. They've actually made properties a first-class construct or a language feature. You know how in the past I've, I keep saying, uh, you know, lambdas are first-class functions or uh, are first-class like objects or members? Well, Kotlin did the same thing for even something as simple as properties, and they've given it some cool features. So what is making properties first class language features given us like you know what is the whole point like we keep talking about properties what is the advantage well for one you get the accesses for free so you don't have to manually write the getters and setters 
Now, this is a very commonly touted feature. Whenever anyone's talking about Kotlin, this is definitely one of the headline features, right? They always say this. Java has you writing tedious getters and setters, but Kotlin, you don't have to write any of it. Well, the reason you don't actually have to write any of it is because those getters and setters are auto-generated. Now, the real beauty with this is how it interrupts with Java. Now, whenever I say the word interrupts, it basically means interoperates. So like, you know, when you have both Java and Kotlin in the same code base and you want both of them to talk to each other, that's basically called interrupts, right? Or interoperating. Now, say you have a property called color, right? And typically the way you would want to like change this property is with the getters get color or set color. Now, in Kotlin, if your class has just the property called color, and I'm saying the word property now again with inverted quotes. So inside a Java class, right? If I have to access the Kotlin property color, then I can actually use get color and set color without me having to actually write those methods in Kotlin, right? So this is like a really cool thing. Now, this is when you call this property color from Java, right? But what if I call this property from another Kotlin class? You can call it in the very same way. You can basically say my object dot get color or my object dot set color. But Kotlin is all about removing like the verbosity, right? Like they want to make it clean and they may, they want to make it simple and intuitive. So the cool thing here with properties in Kotlin is that if you're accessing it within another Kotlin class, you don't even have to write the get or set and call it as a method on top of your object. You can simply just say my object dot color is equal to and the value that you would have basically, you know, called with the setter. So Kotlin automatically understands that when you say dot property is equal to, then you're basically calling the setter. And in the same way, if there's no equal to, so if you just say my object dot color uh, or my object dot property directly, then it understands that, hey, this should reroute to the getter method uh, associated with this property. Now, the reason I'm spelling this out in so much detail is because I really want to hammer this concept through. Kotlin properties are not just internal variables or fields, right? They function as like properties. So it calls the getter or the setter. Let me talk to you about a tricky situation I ran into when I was working at Instacart one day. So if you're at your IDE or, you know, just in front of a computer, open up this link that I put in the show notes uh, to our good old java.util.calendar class, right? Or just like search for it on Google. Look at the implementation for this. So you know how I told you that uh, if you want to call the getter for a class in Kotlin, you can basically just say my object dot color or, you know, my object dot property and it automatically reroutes to the getter. Open up the calendar object. In the calendar dot Java object, it's very interesting because you have both an internal variable uh, or a field, if I'm using the accurate terminology here, called time. So the calendar object has a field called time. And this field returns milliseconds in the return type of long. Now, in this calendar Java object class, it also has a getter called get time. But the funny thing is, this returns a date object. So I'm in a Kotlin class and I say calendar.time. What do you think it calls? Would it call the getter? called get time and return a date object or would it actually point to the field uh, inside this Java object and return a long? Because these are clearly very different things, right? Well, it actually calls the get time accessor method. And this is actually not too hard to figure out once you see that inside the Java util calendar object, the time field is protected, right? So it's not exposed outside. So basically because of that, the only uh, access that you have to the time object is via the getter method. So it actually calls get time and it returns via the accessor. Now, again, if you really want to understand something, you got to push it to the limits, right? So one interesting thing that you can do with Kotlin is that you can actually specify a different package without actually physically placing it in that uh, folder structure, right? So what I did was to test my theory, I actually took a Kotlin class I specified the package as java.util, which you can do. You can't do that in Java. Now I called calendar.time again. What do you think would happen? Because now it's a little different from before. Now both the field is accessible and the getter method is accessible from Java, right? So I'm in the Scotland class. How does it know where to go? Would it go to the field or would it go to the getter method? Both of which are accessible. 
Well, the answer is it actually goes to the field. Now, I wish there was a simple enough uh, formula to help us understand this resolution process. Uh, but I mean, I, I'm sure there probably is, but I couldn't get it. But instead, what I did is I tried to push this to the maximum limit, right? I tried different combinations and I found intuitively I kind of got it over time. So let's see if we can do that together. Ditch the calendar example for now. Let's make it a little simpler, right? Say I have a Java class called person. Inside my Java class person, I have a field, an int field called age, right? So a person's age. To begin with, let's say this age field is public. In the Java class, I also have a getter method called get age which is also public, and that also returns an int field, right? So I have access to both the getter and the field directly. And inside my Kotlin class, I call person.age, right? Where do you think it would resolve? It would go to the field, right? And this we saw this with the calendar example, because if both are present, then it basically directly goes to the field. So say inside this Java class person, I change the package modifier for the age variable, uh, from public int to private int, right? So I have a private int age variable and I have a public accessor method called int get age. So this is all in Java. And in my Kotlin class, I again call person.age using the shorthand syntax. This will work. Uh, if you had doubts, this totally works. It would call the accessor method directly. It would call get age, even though you're not specifying get age, you're just directly calling it with the shorthand syntax dot age. Okay, and this is as advertised. This is like a Kotlin feature that comes uh, directly. Okay, we're gonna make things a little more interesting now and flip the cards, right? If person was a Kotlin class instead of a Java class, uh, and you have the age property inside it, right? Let's consider the different cases here. So I have a person Kotlin class. What if I made the age property public, uh, you know, like val age, declare the age, no problem. But I also had a function or a method declaration, not a custom getter, we'll get to that uh, shortly. I have a function or a method declaration which returns int as a type and it has the name get age. So just as uh, a typical getter method would have. What do you think would happen here? Well, in this case, you'll actually get a compilation error. And the compilation error is actually interesting. It says platform declaration clash. The following declaration has the same JVM signature. So, and the clash that occurs here is because you have an auto-generated property called get age, which, uh, you know, the Java classes would access that property by. And you've actually also declared a function called get age, which the Java classes would also see, right? So Kotlin is smart to understand that this is going to be a problem when you interrupt with Java and throws a compilation error. So let's say I make the val age property declared in my Kotlin class as a, a private val, right? So there's no auto-generated accessors now because you're not even exposing it outside. I do have the function get age, uh, which has the same signature like before. Now, the funny thing here is in Kotlin, you can't actually call just person.age anymore. The shorthand syntax doesn't work because you have to understand that only works for properties. It doesn't work for like this custom function method that you have written. Because remember, the auto-generated getter and setter is a special feature of just properties in Kotlin. It doesn't work the opposite or reverse way, where if I write the custom getter and setter, you somehow magically get a property, right? So if you think about that, it's actually easy to reason this about. So if you need access now to the age uh, property of the class and age is basically private and you only have this getter method available, then you actually have to call it like a traditional method call. So you just say person dot get age open and close parentheses, right? And this is another thing I've found personally helpful to remember. In Kotlin, whenever you declare like a function or method using the, you know, fun function uh, shorthand syntax, this basically means that whenever I call this method from another Kotlin class, I always have to include the open and close uh, parentheses because it points specifically to a function. It doesn't point to a property, right? This shorthand syntax where I can say person.age without you know, calling the get or like adding the parentheses is only applicable 
across properties, right? If I don't have a property, like this is out of the question. I have to call it like a very traditional function or method with open and close parentheses. All right, so uh, there's a lot to digest, but just it's more about conveying the importance of a property. Okay, one last pop quiz, okay? So for Booleans in Java, right, the convention for getter methods is usually tacking on the prefix is. It isn't a get. Let's take an example to make it clear. Say I have a Java class called view. I have a Boolean field uh, called visible. And this is a private Boolean field called visible. And I have both a getter and a setter method. The setter method, as per the convention, is standard, no problems. Set visible uh, is the name of the setter method. But the getter method, we usually call it is visible. You don't have a get visible there, right? So if I have to call this in Kotlin, so inside Kotlin, and I'm using the shorthand syntax, because now uh, by virtue of writing the custom getter and setter in Java and having the variable, it's become a property, right? But how would I access it using the shorthand syntax in Kotlin? Would it be view.visible is equal to something? Or would it be view.isVisible is equal to something? So basically, because I asked the, the prefix is is different, uh, how does Kotlin deal with that? Because uh, if, if you thought it implemented as a basic regex and just top off the get and set and then form uh, the variable, uh, would that work in this case? Well, in this case for Kotlin, uh, it basically uses the is prefix as part of the property. So if I had to use the shorthand syntax in Kotlin and access this property, even though it's internally called visible inside the Java class, you just call it is visible. So I would say view dot is visible is equal to true or view dot is visible is equal to false. So no profound thought or realization there. It's just the decision, I guess, that Kotlin has made. So if you have your Boolean getter uh, in Java as is the name of the property, then you just use that directly in Kotlin. So that's just one last tidbit. One last point before we wind this fragment down. It's important to realize that even if you've declared a property in Kotlin, there's nothing really stopping you from adding a custom getter or setter additionally in that, right? So uh, this sort of allows you to mimic the behavior in Java land where like, you know, I, I kept saying, well, the getter and setter is auto-generated. Sure, it's auto-generated, but that doesn't prevent you from actually writing it manually, right? You can actually write the getter and setter manually. I would actually encourage you to look at the docs to see how you write the syntax for getters and setters because notably it's different from how you do it in Java because in Java, you just write the method, right? So you have get age, set age, and then you have the variable age and then that just becomes the property. But if you did the same thing in Kotlin, like you added a method using the fun keyword, the function uh, get age, uh, set age, it means completely a different thing. Like that is an independent function and has no association with the property, right? So definitely look at the syntax for how you write uh, custom getters and setters for your uh, properties. And it's actually pretty elegant. You know, they've again like killed this. They've hit, it, hit this out of the park. So the reason I bring this up is Kotlin has like these special properties that we call first, la first class language features or functions, but I actually never mentioned how you declare a property in Kotlin, right? So is there anything special you do to make these fields magically become properties? No, it's actually pretty simple. All you have to do is just declare it as a field or a variable inside your Kotlin class, uh, either as a val using the val keyword or the var keyword, right? And if you listen to our previous episode where we talked to Basecamp Dan or Dan Kim, uh, you'll know my way of differentiating this. So you should go back and listen to that episode. It's a good one on Kotlin. So if you have uh, your property as a var, so you've declared your property as a var or a variable, then you have both a getter and setter generated. No sweat. Uh, this makes complete sense, right? It's a variable. You can change You can change the value. So a setter and you want to retrieve the value, there's a getter. What if it was a val? Right. If it was a val, that basically means, you know, uh, Cotton again touts this as like being an immutable variant. So there technically shouldn't be an auto generated setter, right? Because vowels typically you just get the value, you can't set the value, right? Uh, 
honestly one of the best ways i've found to learn anything is just to screw around with the language and push it to the limits right so that's basically what i did i declared a property as a val and i added a custom setter pop quiz time do you think that would work can i slap a, a custom setter on a val property well no simple enough no because you'll get a compilation error right it'll actually say val property cannot have a setter so that's taken care of very straightforward but now it gets interesting right so we think of vowels as being immutable properties but like i said before there's nothing really stopping you from writing that custom getter i could happily just write that custom getter and instead of using the val property i could send in a computed value right and even more scary i could have another property you know say i have a uh, let's take a concrete example i have a class with uh, two properties uh, a val property a which uh, is immutable and i could have a variable property called b right now inside this custom getter that i write for the val property a i could actually return b there's nothing stopping me from doing that and even 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 more scarier outside because b is uh, mutable i could change the value of b and that inherently means the next time i call the getter for the val in inverted quotes property a that i would think to be immutable the value would change so it's actually not immutable right now uh, another dan uh, dan lu again friend of the show or as i like to call him rx dan he has an excellent blog post uh, where he's like talked about this and gone into great detail i'll make sure to drop a link to that in the show notes i again i enc- i encourage you highly to read that cuz you know the guy knows how to write a good blog post the tldr is he points out that properties created as a val aren't necessarily immutable they are read only it's a subtle distinction but it's an important one to realize so just go and read the blog post and it'll make that super clear so it's time to wind this fragment down i hope you gathered some interesting tidbits about uh, properties again in inverted quotes in kotlin let me know what you think of this episode did you find it useful is there something else you'd like to hear are there follow up questions do you think this is interesting do you want more of these kind of like episodes where we talk about some of the interesting nuances in kotlin uh yeah let me know and we'll try to see if we can come up with more of these episodes that's it for the show folks i will catch you in the next episode keep writing kotlin That's it for the show folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening and we will catch you in the next episode.